it's an honor for me to be your host tonight and to interview Horacio Castellanos Moya. The program for tonight uh, will be as follows. Um, as follows, I will briefly introduce um, uh, the writer and his oeuvre. Then he will read an excerpt from his uh, latest novel, Moronga. Afterwards, I will ask some questions and um, at the end, I will give you the opportunity to, give, uh, to ask some questions uh, as well. Um, and then afterwards, uh, Mr. Castellanos Moya will be happy to sign your books. Um, it is not an exaggeration to say that uh, Horacio Castellanos Moya alongside uh, Guatemalan Rodrigo Rey Rosa, is the most important Central American writer of his generation. The son of a Honduran mother and a Salvadoran father, Castellanos Moya was born in 1957. After spending his early childhood in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, the family moved to El Salvador, where he studied literature and acquired his first experience in journalism. At the outburst of the Civil War in the 1980s, Castellanos Moya supported the guerrillas of the Frente Farabundo Martí de Liberación Nacional, working as a press agent for the fighters in Costa Rica and Mexico. Quite soon, however, he would lose his fate in the revolution. His first novel, The Diaspora, reflects this disillusion by portraying a group of guerrilleros in Mexican exile who turned their back on revolution after the cowardly murder of a female commandant. At the beginning of the 90s, with the end of the civil war imminent, Castellanos Moya returned to El Salvador in order to contribute to the construction of, the free fr of a free press. In his literary and political essays of this time, uh, of that time, sorry, he expresses the hope that literature can be part of the nation building process. He says, who said at that time that literature does not describe a country, but invents it. Once again, he was disillusioned um, by reality. His next novels, Dance with Snakes, and even more the widely acclaimed Revulsion, Elasco, mercilessly reckoned with the politics and culture of post-Civil War El Salvador. Due to the diatribe revulsion, uh, revulsion, Elasco, he received death threats and had to leave his homeland. Ever since, he has been living in several countries, including Mexico, Guatemala, Germany, and the US, where he currently works as a professor of creative writing. If I explicitly called him a Central American writer, it is because from, from exile he keeps on looking back upon the territory Pablo Neruda famously called La Dolorosa Cintura de America, the delicate waste of America. Invariably, in Castellanos Moyas's novel, uh, this territory is deeply infected by lawlessness, corruption, and violence. To cite one example, the novel Senselessness alludes to the massacres of the Guatemalan Indians by General Efrain Rios Montt. Over the years, Castellanos Moyas' book, books have been translated in France, Germany, Italy, and the US and other countries, Denmark, uh, including Denmark. Uh, among other awards, he received the Prix Transfuge du Meilleur Roman d'Amérique Latine for his latest novel, Moronga, which will be our main topic today. In Moronga, the Central American violence has migrated uh, to the US, both in a tangible and psychological way. Even more important than the explicit, explicit drug-related gang violence is the paranoia that haunts the two protagonists. Both Jose Celedon, a bus driver, bus driver and surveillance officer, and Erasmo Aragon, a university professor, uh, fruitlessly try to escape their nightmares of guerrilla and civil war. The second part of the novel is narrated by uh, Aragon. The excerpt Mr. Castellanos Moya will be reading corresponds to the beginning of this second part, when Aragon arrives in Washington to investigate, investigate the murder of the revolutionary poet Roque Dalton. I give the floor to you. Thank you, Jasper. Thanks to Passaporta for inviting me. Thanks to you for being here with this heat wave. Um, I will read the first chapter of the second part of Moronga, as Jasper said. I will read in Spanish, and it seems that it's going to be there in French or English, right? Aterricé a mediodía, el segundo dominio de, domingo de junio en el aeropuerto Ronald Reagan, 
pese a que me había prometido a mí mismo nunca utilizar ese aeropuerto con el nombre de un sujeto tan criminal e ignorante. Pero ya sabemos que los principios languidecen cuando se trata del bolsillo. Y no solo el boleto aéreo resultaba más barato y el traslado a la ciudad mucho más cómodo que si hubiese utilizado el aeropuerto Dulles, sino que al final de cuentas, ponerme a comparar cuál de los dos sujetos, si Ronald Reagan o John Foster Dulles, había sido más tóxico y nocivo para la humanidad a fin de decidir qué boleto me convenía, hubiese sido una tontería. Caminé por los pasillos y bajé a la zona de equipaje, pues, con cierta emocioncilla, que era mi primera vez en la capital del imperio, y también con cierto recelo, pues aunque yo procedía del aeropuerto de Chicago y era profesor en el minúsculo Merlot College al sur de Wisconsin, con mis documentos migratorios en regla, es de conocimiento público que a cada extranjero que arriba a esta metrópoli se le somete a un intenso escrutinio, a fin de detectar si no trae velados propósitos de hacerla volar por los aires sueño de muchos, y no fuera a ser que en una de esas, hurgando en mi pasado, los fisgones profesionales descubrieran un dato que les atrajera. No soy tan importante, me repetí para tranquilizarme, mientras esperaba mi maleta en la banda del equipaje, y desde ahí aproveché para llamar al dueño de la habitación en la que pernoctaría, con quien hasta entonces solo había mantenido comunicación vía email y de quien yo no tenía antecedente alguno, aparte de aquellos comentarios, siempre sospechosos de ser escritos con intereses promocionales, que aparecían en el portal Airbnb, empresa a través de la cual hice los arreglos para rentar la habitación durante cinco noches, que ese era todo el tiempo que podía permanecer en esa ciudad, no porque fuese suficiente para disfrutar de sus atractivos, o para la investigación que me proponía hacer, sino porque solo para eso me alcanzaban los fondos que una beca del Merlow College me había proporcionado y de los cuales tenía que dar cuenta en detalle, según me advirtió la mujer rolliza y coqueta que los administraba. Vi aparecer mi maleta azul marino por la banda en el preciso instante en que el dueño de la habitación respondía a mi llamada y me decía que él estaría en casa toda la tarde que una vez que yo llegara a la estación de metro Silver Spring lo llamara de nuevo. La casa estaba a unas pocas cuadras, pero él iría a recogerme en su coche para facilitar mi traslado con la maleta, todo lo cual ya era de mi conocimiento, pues me lo había dicho por email y yo había rastreado en los mapas de Google las rutas, distancias y tiempos para moverme en esa zona y también en las partes de la ciudad que me competían, que a veces me distraigo y termino extraviado. Le agradecí de nuevo su gesto, en especial ahora, cuando traté de sacar la maleta de la banda con una mano, mientras sostenía el celular con la otra, lo que resultó imposible. Me lastimaría la muñeca. Pesaba más de lo prudente. Siempre metía yo más ropa de la necesaria. Y no quería ni imaginar lo que sufriría mi brazo y mi espalda si alguna de las estaciones de metro carecía de escaleras eléctricas ni tampoco lo que sería empujarla bajo el calor asfixiante del verano las siete cuadras entre Silver Spring y la casa donde me hospedaría. Por eso, antes de salir en busca de la estación de metro, le pregunté a un negro gigantón con uniforme de empleado del aeropuerto cuál era la ruta más conveniente para andar llegando a ella y volteé hacia mi maleta para que viera el peso de mi problema. Ante lo que el susodicho señaló hacia un ascensor que me había pasado desapercibido y farfulló una parrafada de la que nada entendí. Asunto de acentos, me dije. Aunque en el acto recordé que en algún lugar había escuchado que en esa ciudad los negros y los salvadoreños se reservaban una repulsión mutua y más me valía andar alerta. No hubo ningún incidente durante mi viaje en el metro. Más allá de la ansiedad natural que siempre padezco al cruzar un torniquete con una maleta grande por el miedo a quedarme trabado y ser el asmerreír de los circundantes. 
Y para mi suerte, tanto en la estación Gallery Place, donde hice el cambio de línea, como en Silver Spring, mi destino, hubo escaleras eléctricas que facilitaron mi viaje. Pero si bien es cierto que no hubo incidente, sí hubo una impresión que conmovió mi psiquis, sin ánimo de exagerar. Y es que yo procedía de un pequeño pueblo universitario del Medio Oeste, donde casi la totalidad de la población era de origen nórdico y puritano. Tantas rubias y rubios que uno terminaba confundiéndolos, como si estuviese entre chinos. Un pueblo que de tan chico y seguro uno podía dormir sin echar el pestillo a la puerta de la calle. Algo que por supuesto a mí nunca me sucedió. Que a mi edad la sospecha ya se había hecho coágulo en la sangre y era imposible deshacerme de ella. Pero los tres años que había vivido en ese pueblito habían sido suficientes para que me desacostumbrara a encontrarme con sujetos con mi jeta y aspecto. Que eso fue lo que me sucedió en los vagones de metro en que me conducía y de golpe impresionó mi psiquis. El hecho de que en las entrañas del imperio me encontrara rodeado de sujetos originarios del mismo país del que yo procedía. Y como las rutas de la mente son impredecibles... Enseguida fui presa de una sensación de orgullo, bastante estúpida, para ser sincero, que nada hay de qué orgullecerse por ser originario de un sitio semejante, ni de sitio alguno, como si el orgullo fuera una virtud y no un pecado propio de acomplejados. Claro que ya sabía yo que me los encontraría a montones, pero una cosa es la información y otra lo que, galpea, lo que golpea con contundencia nuestros sentidos y hace ladrar a la memoria. Por lo que presto me espabilé, tomé con mayor decisión la manija de la maleta y la correa de la mochila que había colocado en el asiento contiguo y mantuve las antenas en alto. En especial cuando entró al vagón una pareja de tatuados con toda la pinta de pandilleros. Gracias. So, as we just heard the, the, the speech of the second narrator of the novel, Aragon, is some kind of uh, stream of consciousness. Uh, if you uh, watch at the layout of the novel, it's not divided into um, paragraphs. On the other hand, the first part, uh, the first narrator, Celadon, is more, um, yeah, his, his speech is more in short phrases, uh, a lot of dialogue, etc. So, um, more matter of fact. So my first question would be, how did you conceive these two characters and their, their, vo their voices? Um, first of all, Aragon, the second character, the one that is a professor in the university, he, he has been around in my books. He was the main character of the novel before this one, that is called El Sueño del Retorno, The Dream of My Return. But that novel takes place 20 years before this one. And he forms, he's part of a group of characters that are related with six novels that I've written that are a, like kind of group of novels about the family Aragon, the Aragon family, right? So he is the, the youngest of that family. Um, There is one book, The Titan Memory, where is the, the his, it's about his grandfather, and then other books are his uncle. His, it's kind of, of, of a character that um, has been around, not that much, I mean. But now, um, is I, I took him and brought him to the U.S., you know, because the last time that I deal with him, he was in Mexico in 1991. So 20 years later, in 2010, in this novel, he's in the U.S. and he's um, um, a professor. So, because I had work on him, the b novel before was not that difficult to go into his mentality. I just had to, to work on developing him his, his mental illnesses uh, a little bit deeper in the sense that after 20 years you get worse. But... Um, So I had the, the tone, this way of writing with a lot of uh, subordinate sentences and this long paragraph and this uh, 
way of telling a story in which things almost don't happen is just what is in his mind. Yeah. I mean, things happen, but um, are not important things. Uh, that are events. It's important how those events are in her, his mind. And his mind is a very peculiar mind in the sense that it's very, as you say, very paranoid. It's very fixed in events and ideas and it's repeating what is happening. The first character, Celedon, that was a, that was a big challenge for me because I never, I work on him like uh, when he was 20 years old in a novel that is called La Sirviente del Luchador. And it was just one chapter. That novel has not been translated into English. It's in French, um, but not in English. And, um, and by then, when he was 20, he was becoming a guerrilla fighter. He had all the enthusiasm and all the uh, illusions and all the ideals of, of changing society. Though he was not an ideologist, he was just a guy that was very excited by adventure, you know, by taking risks. And so he was doing some killings and some shootings, like uh, when you are 20 years, that you are having a lot of adrenaline to do that. But now I put him 40 years later, when mm -hmm. he is not 30 years later, when he's 50 and he's completely defeated in the US as a bus driver. So for me, it was very difficult because the last time that I dealt with him, he, I, dealt, I, I, I wrote in third person and was, I was, not, was just mm -hmm. a very secondary character in a book. And now for me to create this voice of someone that has all this guiltiness because of he has killed not only many people, but he killed his mother, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is uh, so a kind of event. He didn't mean to do it, but he was shooting a car where. So uh, they they sorry, so they feel guilty. Um, they also have to cope with uh, paranoia. And if there's one thing both uh, characters share, it's this paranoia, but they also share the way of coping with it, and that is sex. And I don't know if I can, I can tell what uh, the title oh yeah, means, yeah. Uh, because sure. I didn't know before reading, and at a certain point I discovered, because uh, you explained it in your book, so moronga is a kind of um, sausage. Blood sausage. Uh -huh, blood sausage in uh, Central America, but also a way to refer uh, to the penis. Um, and then, uh, especially the, the second character, Aragon, I, th I, th I think that um, for him, sex is a way of escaping the paranoia. Uh, I don't know if I understood that well. or. Uh yeah, I don't know if he can escape paranoia, but um, he tries. And I think that he's very obsessive with sex. Mm -hmm. Contrary to the first character, that he's not related with sex. He's just much more kind of guy that wants to uh, forget whatever he has done. That's why his, his main language is silence in a way. But um, the second character is completely, he has always been completely obsessed with sex. And I think that sex for is part of this kind of compulsion towards reality, right? Mm -hmm. Of escaping all the time. He's escaping all the time. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you don't only write about him, about um, Central Americans in exile, but you also depict the US, US society and their ways of, um, of yeah, dealing with sexuality, the, the roles sexuality play in that society, also references to European culture, to, to Germany. Uh, and I, I thought while re reading the book that uh, sex seems to fulfill a different need for um, the US characters than for the Latin American characters and European characters. Um, I think that has to do with death. I think that if you are close to death, sex means different if you are not close to death. Um, so he, this, this, this character, mainly the last one that you mentioned, he has been close to death with a very high sensitivity mm -hmm. and he has been deeply affected. If you see I'm not inventing this, it's like if you go to a war, if you have been, I mean, if you went to Saigon or if you went to San Salvador during the Civil War, if you went to Iraq during the occupation of the American troops, whatever, you see that uh, the big industry besides the war is sex. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, because death and sex are completely, that's a Greek, a, a Greek myth, right? So it's like... So it doesn't really fulfill a different need for uh, an American or for Latin American? It, it depends on where you are, I mean, what you do. I think that um, what the character does there, this character, both of them, is criticize American culture in a yeah. way. But not criticize American culture in a sense, in an ideological way. It's just a surviving way. You know, they don't, they don't understand. You know what I mean? Yeah. The first character don't understand. I mean, these people, why they are like that? Mm -hmm. they wh wh why they surveillance everything? I mean, if if they don't even know who I am, mm -hmm. you know, why I am the surveiller? I'm the one that are in charge of the cameras, and they don't know who I am. I'm, I'm fake. You know, the character that is surveillance yeah. is in charge of surveillance. Yeah. The town, the bus driver, he's fake. Mm -hmm. That's not his name, that's a fake. He just got a fake identity after the Civil War and that's, they don't know who he is. And so it's like a kind of reflection on that, reflection mm -hmm. on how useless could be too. Yeah, so the one is a surveillance uh, agent and the other one, Aragon, is a professor and he's always afraid of uh, being making, of being surveilled and um, making yeah, mistakes um, like uh, seducing students and that kind of things. He's very aware of that, that yeah. he's like in an enemy, ter in a, like enemy territory, right? That yeah. he, cannot, he can just not do anything. He mm -hmm. has to behave like if he's completely under surveillance in every yeah. level. He even thinks when he's taking a shower that there are cameras there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I cannot do this, I cannot do that because there must be cameras there. So he's very affected. Mm -hmm. And without going into biographical detail, but is that something that you experienced in the United States and you've been living there for a while in the last years with the outburst of the Me Too phenomenon and all that? Did it change? Did it influence your novel? I don't think so, because this novel was written before that. I mean, it was written before Me Too and that. Not because before the surveillance and all what Snowden told about that and all what we know about how everything is surveillance here or there or everywhere. I mean, I think this uh, is not a U.S. problem. It's a problem of, the of our times, right? That we don't have private life, that we don't have privacy, that we... And we give that by free, of course, because mm -hmm. we love to give that. So in that sense, um, in this particular case of the character, it's much more that they confront a Latin American culture of that is a macho culture, that is full of biases, that is full of, of, of um, impunity. And you come to another culture like the U.S. and they don't feel comfortable. You know, they mm -hmm. don't feel comfortable. And it doesn't matter if one is a professor and one is just a bus driver and, and, and a fake guy. It means that there is a gap between the two cultures, mm -hmm. you know. It means that there are some rules of this culture that doesn't apply to this culture. And the guys that come from this culture, I, that are escaping their countries and have to adapt to this country because that's where they want to go to get safety and to get money. They have problems to adapt. Mm -hmm. you know? But one way of, of trying to adapt is uh, at least how the first character does, uh, Celadon. He spends his spare time watching television series. Like oh, sure. there are references in your book to uh, The Wire, also to uh, Breaking Bad. So I ask myself, what does, was that a kind of influence while writing the book? I don't have TV, but anyway, but... <laughs> and, and also, um, <laughs> the, the book I, I could hear be about it. I hear uh -huh. about it. I am a little bit isolated of my time, but um, I get things. Mm -hmm. And now I've been thinking about this stuff of series that is even worse, because now that Netflix has opened his office in Mexico City and Madrid is like, uh, now every political topic, con controversial mm -hmm. political topic has a theory. Yeah. So you say, wow, you know, now we are going to understand history through series. We, we don't need historians. We don't need history. They are the series, right? 
and you have the narcos and now you have Colosio case in Mexico and then you have this other case and you t every big killing, every big thing is developed by series and, and, and that's the spirit of our times. It's not something mm -hmm. that you could fight against, right? But make you think uh, about what is happening. Mm -hmm. right? So this character, the first character is completely escaping through Sirius. I don't mm -hmm. think that he's learning through Sirius because he has been worse than in the Sirius, mm -hmm. right? He has been a, a man of action, right? Of, 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 of doing things. And, and but he doesn't want to think, think. He doesn't want to think. That's the main point. And Sirius are very good if you don't want to think. Okay, I think that's, <laughs> that's interesting. So um, <laughs> you think it's a dangerous? Uh, tendency, uh, the fact that especially Latin America is um, very present in a series you've mentioned, Narcos, there also. Oh, I think that this culture has its way of escaping. I mean, human beings don't like to think. You know, it's I mean about the real issues that are affecting you. You don't want to think about that. There are some mm -hmm. of us that try to think, but it's not mm -hmm. a popular thing. You know, you can escape to Syria, you can escape through football here, or you can escape to to sports in the U.S. Is there, there is way of escaping. The fact is that you don't face okay, where but things maybe it are can boring. take you to to read a book. To read a book, I, I don't think so. No, you don't <laughs> think so. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then uh, the other thing I want I wanted to ask uh, because there's an influence of uh, seems seem to be an influence of television series, but there's not. I was wrong. Oh no, there is there uh -huh. is an influence because that's uh -huh. the spirit of our times. What I yeah. mean is that I don't uh, study that for right. I just mentioned them like mm -hmm. it's a way of escaping, right? Yeah, I, I think it also could your book could be converted into a, a uh, series. Yeah. series. <laughs> yes. That would uh, be nice, especially <laughs> especially the the epilogue yeah. is very um, uh, movie like. Uh, but there's there are other influences as well, and uh, I think we should talk about uh, a literary influence, which is uh, Roque Dalton. Roque Dalton was uh, a poet, um, a Salvadoran poet, revol revolutionary poet, uh, who at a certain point, um, I didn't uh, really uh, uh, know because I wasn't born yet, but uh, people who were, uh, um, I don't know, uh were experiencing uh, um, their times in the 60s and the 70s. Even outside La Latin America, Rocket Dalton was kind of a well-known figure. Uh, but then suddenly he was forgotten. And maybe, I, don't, I guess, in Sal El Salvador, he's still uh, considered an important uh, um, writer. Um, but why was he um, forgotten? And is your novel a, a, a kind of attempt to... I've been... I've been I mean, Roque Dalton, of course, is the most important poet in El Salvador, but um, and I think he's uh, one of the most important poets of the 60s and 70s in Latin America, right? But he has been forgotten because he was known by his worst poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, which means that he was known for his communist poetry mm -hmm. but not for his real poetry that is something that goes deep about the relationship uh, about the about love about hate and about himself mainly but he has some kind of uh, he was a revolutionary as you said but um, He's well known not because of his war, but because of the fact that he was killed by his own cameras, right? Mm -hmm. Which is um, something not usual, or rather unusual in, 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 in Latin America. He's the only poet that has been killed by the, his own guerrilla fighters, accused of being a CIA agent. And um, and that was in 1975, and that um, marked a that was a turning point in the relationship between writers and revolution in Latin America, I guess. Even some people don't, don't think that way, but I think that way because Roque Dalton was not someone that was around, you know, uh, just supporting a cause. Roque Dalton was a, a guerrilla fighter. He was, uh, he was trained in Cuba. He was uh, 
framed as a, as a secret agent by the Q, and he was captured by the CIA in El Salvador. He, he was tried to be turned into a double agent, and he escaped. And I've been dealing with all these cables of the CIA that has been disclassified, so I have the whole story about it. And, and the fact is that uh, because of the political level of his case, his poetry has not been read, yep. read as should be read. And so, and that's unavoidable, either, you know, because that's unavoidable. Yeah. If you are the case, I mean, you are the case. It's not your poetry. Maybe after some years, people will go back to his poetry. I think that something like that happened a couple of, like five centuries ago with, um, with this uh, British writer, well, English writer um, of the time of Shakespeare that wrote uh, plays too. Uh, the um, no, the other one? Marlowe. Thank Christopher you. <laughs> Christopher Marlowe was killed mm. by his own friends in a spy problem. His body was never found, like Roque Dalton, his body was never found. He was shot by his friends. His brother, nobody knows where the, the body is. And so, a, and what you have is the anecdote. Uh -huh. It's so heavy, the anecdote, that nothing is left to do the reading of the good poetry. So after some centuries, maybe things are going to happen. Anyway, in this book, the second character, Aragon, is researching on one episode of Dalton revolutionary life and that's how it's related with this that yeah. you mentioned but it's not too much about the influence in itself that could be because I think that I'm influenced by Roque Dalton in the sense of, of, of a way of facing literature and life but but here the relationship is very direct you know he is there mm -hmm. Okay, another famous um, Salvadoran figure is um, Oscar Romero, the, the Archbishop, um, who also in Belgium is uh, quite well known. Um, and last year he was uh, canonized. And uh, this year at the University of Leuven, they, they made the, the academic year uh, the Oscar Romero uh, year. And he also appears uh, briefly in your uh, novel. So I ask myself, um, what is his heritage for Salvador, El Salvador in, in particular and for the world in general? Wow, that's, that's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question. But what, what, can we, what should we um, remember about him? I think that he was, uh, as we say in Spanish, he was a nombre honrado, which is a lot. He was a kind of honest man. And, uh, and he did his job with uh, a lot of passion. And, and he was aware that he was going to be killed because his job. And he didn't care, so he was a little... We can say that he was um, very brave. And he was not looking for anything else which is uh, something special, something quite Christian, I guess, if you read the, I'm not a Christian, but if you read the, the Gospels, that's very Christian, right? That he was just looking for, for doing that's good. He was not an ideologist. He was not part of the theology of liberation. That's false, <laughs> completely fake. He was just someone that belonged to the conservative establishment. Then suddenly became Archbishop, and all this, poor people that was killed by the army came and he just started to be awakened by these people and, and each, each Sunday he say the army went to this town to kill these people, these people, these people, next Sunday and the peasants were there with him and he was telling the army came here to be and he was just like a kind of um, shepherd, mm -hmm. real shepherd. So he was in his time that he was killed, of course, by the right, by the art. But um, the legacy, of course, the legacy of this kind of, of, of person, kind of martyr, this kind of Christian martyr is, is huge all the time. And mainly is in the moral level, right? In the moral 
sphere. But you never considered writing about him? No, I don't write about martyrs or heroes. It's too but much for but me. in uh, yeah. senselessness, you do write about uh, a Guatemalan. Oh, yeah, but uh, you should see that uh, this is the opposite because this guy doesn't believe in anything and he's just completely becoming crazy because he's reading about these massacres, massacre after massacre after massacre. But he's just thinking about drinking and about other things. So it's a very complicated character. The one that tells that story is not a, a good and bad story. I mean, there is no good guys and bad guys. The good guys that are investing, uh, doing research in the, in the killings, you are not so sure if they are good, right? And the bad guys are bad, that you don't have any doubt. But what I mean is that it's not literature doesn't work with uh, good and evil in the sense of... Uh, of so kind of a schematic way. I mean, you know that every human being has evil and good. I mean, every human being could be as good as bad, depending on his circumstances and his location, many things. So, in literature, I don't, I don't, I don't like these characters that are so, so very clear, you know, mm -hmm. because there are no shades where to grasp. Mm -hmm. There is a good. I mean, I think that the novel, the, I mean, the book of Monsignor Romero was written many years ago by T. S. Eliot. There is a play called Murder in the Cathedral. That's okay. That's the book. Um, <laughs> well, I think outside uh, Romero, um, if, if you ask someone here, what do you know about El Salvador, or who do you know, which uh, famous um, Salvadoran do you know? I don't know if anybody could say a name. Um, and sometimes, also in my in my in my courses, I I ask my students were not uh, about El Salvador, but, but about Central Ameri American general. What do you think? What, what images uh, do you connect with uh, Central America and often we don't know what to say because it's a region that really is yeah. underrepresented in the news and the same goes for its literature. Um, traditionally uh, Central American literature is really um, isolated, has been isolated maybe last year it's changing because um, the yeah, I can give the example of the Nicaraguan writer um, Ramirez, Sergio Ramirez, who um, was awarded uh, Cervantes Prize. There's also uh, a younger Guatemalan writer, um, Eduardo Alfon, who's gaining some international attention. Um, do you see it as a, as a tendency or do you still feel that literature of uh, Central America is uh, very... Yeah. No, Central America is... Um region that has kind of exceptional writers. It's not as uh, you have uh, this bunch of Mexican and Argentina writers that you can pull a train and there are still people that cannot get that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Central America, you have Darío, mm -hmm. right? And then Darío is the founder of the more language in Spanish. Where Darío come from? A little town, nobody knows. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. Central America is not, because Central America doesn't have the cultural institutions to be present and will never have them, at least in the future that I see. If you see Colombian literature, it's because there are Colombian institutions, you know, mm -hmm. the state invests in Colombian institutions mm -hmm. or Argentinian institutions or Mexican institutions. And you have the presence of those writers in different places in the world, which is good. Mm -hmm. Central America is so poor. Maybe it's the same Bolivia or Ecuador or Paraguay. But nobody knows. And um, so it's, it doesn't work that way because you will never have that presence, right? Mm -hmm. And because there is another reason. Central America is not a big market. And so, if you are not a big market, I mean, you can have a very good writer, but who cares about if he doesn't have a big market in his own country? You know, it's the way of thinking of the publishing houses because they are doing business. So, I think that the tendency will be the same. There are big exceptions, like Darío. Who is the first novelist that won the Nobel Prize? Miguel Ángel Asturias. Mm -hmm from Latin America, many years before Garcia Marquez, 
many years before Vargas Llosa, right? Yeah. And so he yeah, has also been a bit forgotten. Yeah. In Asturias. Yeah, but what I mean is that because there is no a uh, institutionality that gives you the support to be present, and in, I mean Asturias is forgotten a lot in Latin America. I think that the place where Asturias is much more well considered is in Paris. Mm -hmm. Still France, right? Maybe a little bit in Spain, but more France. But the Rio is everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. and and our exceptions. That that's the way it's going to be working. You know, you mentioned some people contemporary. I'm not going to give any opinion on that because they are people even younger than me, some of them. So, and you know, time is terrible. You know, so time could be the worst. Either so, uh, and mm. some writers um, choose to to move to Spain or to the United States. If we talk about Latin American literature, present day Latin American literature in general, um, I, I don't think so. I think that Spain ha has not anymore the same attraction that used mm -hmm. to have for Latin American writers. Mm -hmm. Many Latin American writers, and I'm not talking about Central America. I'm talking about Argentina and about. Colombia and about uh, South American countries and even Mexico, they are coming back. Mm -hmm. The Spain economy is not in the best shape. So, mm -hmm. And the U.S. for some could be an opportunity, but um, the U.S. is another planet, right? It's another language, it's another way of, of understanding everything. So you can survive there, but you don't belong. I mean, you can be there. Okay, you years. don't belong, but uh, last week we had um, the Mexican author Valeria Luiselli here, a uh, young Mexican author who uh, in her latest novel chose to write in English. Uh -huh. um, so that's an option. There are other examples as well. There's a, a Peruvian-born author who's called Daniel Alarcón, good writer, also writes in English. So those who are based in, in, uh, in America, they, they choose to write in English. I think it's are different, guess, both of them, because Daniel Arcon didn't choose. He was raised in the U.S., you know. Mm -hmm. He was like, uh, he was brought to the U.S. very young. I think that in the case of Valeria Luce, it's different because she's very privileged, so she maybe could write in another language too, right? Mm -hmm. So she's like, like the ca case of Nabokov. That could he didn't know if write in English or in French because he, he was not going to write in Russian anymore because was not fashionable, but um, Alarcón is different. I think there are many, many examples of different situations with writers from Latin America in the U.S. because there is these two that you mentioned. Then there are the ones that belong to the first generation that uh, have been able to go to university and to start to write books and and there is a big debate about this and it's mm -hmm. very interesting I think because um, I, I should say that I'm a very conservative in this mm -hmm. I think that a writer is his language so for me someone that writes in English doesn't belong to any tradition it's like that right it doesn't belong to Latin American literature no mm -hmm. you know dia doesn't belong to Latin American it belongs to Mm -hmm. U.S. Nabokov doesn't belong to Russian tradition, mm -hmm. right? Even though that published like five, seven novels in, in, in Russian. But maybe it's more complicated because you will say, why, Cioran is a French philosopher or is a Romanian philosopher? Belongs to the Romanian tradition or belongs to the French? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you start to think uh, the relationship between... But there are some people that think that because we have all this immigration toward the U.S., there will be something very special. And I'm not that positive. You know what I mean? In the sense that uh, these waves of immigrants have been in the U.S. for hundreds of years, 200 years. And you don't have this wave of... You think that Don DeLillo is an Italian novelist? No. <laughs> okay. So he's an American novelist, right? And so yeah. it's like you change language, you change, change values, you change way of think, you change way of seeing life. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm not so sure, and I don't want to say this, I don't want to go into this too deeply because I don't have too many defined ideas. I just have a lot of questions about it, right? You know, a lot of mm. questions. For instance, all these Central American new generation of writers that are in the US that what they know how to write is English, because they don't know how to write in Spanish. They don't have the choice of defining because the language that they learn in the school is English. They, maybe they speak Spanish because I have this kind of skill. Mm -hmm. But they, because in the, in the, in the family they, they talk Spanish. But what they handle well is English. You know? mm -hmm. And so are they going to be in 20 years Latin American writers? That's a very controversial question. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that not or yes, because it's, it's complicated. Uh -huh. but, uh, but we have to see uh, every angle of that. Mm -hmm. do, do you read them, the, the younger generations? Not too much. No. Not too <laughs> much. <laughs> okay, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask more. Um, some of them, yes, and I enjoy uh -huh. them, but uh, some of them... Okay. Not. Who, who it's not my job. I, I just read mm -hmm. the ones that are my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because your generation um, is uh, the generation of writers who were born in the 50s. Uh, we are old, uh, yeah. Which was a good generation. <laughs> with I also already mentioned uh, Rodrigo Rey Rosa, but there's also this monument with uh, Roberto Bolaño. Yeah. And uh, Roberto Bolaño, for many um, writers, also for many critics, uh, he's been considered as the last uh, Latin American writer. So, um, if that's right, if, you're, uh, if you think that's right, then you also are part of this last generation of Latin American writers. What we were talking about, the language and these, uh, these changes. Do you, do you feel part of a generation or of this um, last generation of real Latin American writers who share certain themes, a certain way of, of, of writing and looking at, at the continent? I don't think we are. I think there are new generations that they have a kind of um, spirit of a group too. I mean, we were not a group. We, when we talk about generation here, we are talking about people that were born in the same period and that grew up more or less in the same circumstances and face reality and history m more or less in the same way. And and in that sense, the ones that were born in the fifties, uh, we have that. We are the last generation that grew up under the Cold War. That's real. That I could say that we are the last mm -hmm. that grew up under the Cold War, right? And that was very important for us because we were. The place where part of the Cold War took mm -hmm. place. I'm sorry for repeating, but um, <coughs> but I think that there are new generations. You mentioned some of them that are like Halfon, or you can say Sambra, or you can say uh, there, there are. You know, they have. They belong to a new generation of people mm -hmm. that have grown up in a different circumstances, mm -hmm. they don't know this radicalism and this polarization and all this politics. We were the last infected politically generation in a way mm -hmm. because we were very political. Why? Because we were born almost at the end of the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. You were not born there and you were born later and you were raised where the there was democracy when you were raised, as many of these New York writers, there were no dictatorship in Argentina, no dictatorship in Chile, no dictatorship in Uruguay. You know, there was uh, no more dictatorship in Central America or the pre was opening everything in Mexico and you can have the new Paris, if, that, if those were news. Uh, then you have things in common, right? They are okay. they, so there are. I don't think that we are the last generation. I think that there is there are always new generations of Latin American writers, the ones born in the 60s, in the 70s, and even in the 80s, 
that um, are conscious of, of, of what they are doing in the sense that they, they define themselves, right? And do you think that for the younger author authors it has been easier to get their books translated um, and that your generation, on the other hand, suffered um, a bit, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, yeah, started to write under the shadow of the, the boom generation? Or don't you see I it that I way? I don't think so. I think uh, that maybe the market has grown because everything has grown a lot, right? But I mean, if you ask me that question to me, I will say yes, for me it was very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But you were mentioning Rodrigo Rey Rosa, this is one year younger than I, and he's from Guatemala, next door. And I remember in Rodrigo's apartment, looking at all his translations, I was just so envious, say, fuck, nobody translates <laughs> me. And, and he has all <laughs> his books. So it's like, you know, it happens, right? It's, it happens. And, and, and of course, if you are a country, let's say Argentina, and you say, um, Argentina is going to be the guest country in the Frankfurt Book Fair, and so there is a budget to translate our Argentinian writers to German, and so that's different, right? Because that's an effort. And you go that year to Germany, and you will see all this translation, and that's very good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm jealous of that, but that's very good. But what I mean that that is going, that is not going to happen in such way. You do it yours. I mean, you, it happened to you, but yourself, or there won't be this. Sergio Ramirez, you mentioned here, yep. is uh, the most important writer alive from Central America. He just won the Cervantes Prize, and he's doing a lot of effort to create some kind of cultural institution in Central America. Mm -hmm. He has this Central America Cuenta. There is a literary festival every year. He invites writers from everywhere in order just to make visible yeah. the writers of Central America, which is, that gives you an, a, an idea that what the governments cannot do to support mm -hmm. anything because they are, they have other priorities or they just rob all the money. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, there is, there are things that are done, but mm -hmm. that's the situation. Okay, um, apart from writing novels, you're also a, a professor of creative writing in, um, in the United States, in Iowa University. I just want to ask myself, what is the most important advice you give your students? Oh, that's easier because uh, for me, that's just to look for their own voices. I mean, they have to, to find their own voice, to find their own universe, to find their own story, to find their own way of writing what they want to have, what they want to write. So it's much more about, it's not about technique or it's not about, it's about going deeply inside you and trying to get what you want to say, right? Because mm -hmm. for me that's, uh, that's the main thing for, for I mean, I can... Do you I believe that it's something that you can learn, that you can teach? You can learn to share point of view, you can learn to read, you can learn to how to, to write correctly. But the search that you have to do inside yourself, no one is going to do it but you. Right, so, and that's the key, the key point. And that's, some people call that talent, some people call that different ways, but what you have to say, to, to look for is, uh, you want to say? Mm. You want to say something or you just want to be famous or you just want to be part of a business? Or you have something to say? And if you have something to say, look for it. Everybody has something to say, but look mm. for it, right? And so I think that that's the key point. Um, well, as I mention, mentioned in my introduction at a certain point, I think at the beginning of the, the 90s, when you returned to El Salvador af after the Civil War, um, you really believed in the, the social and political power of literature or wanted to believe in it. And uh, you stated that literature does not describe a country but invents it. 
Um, now we're nearly 30 years later. Um, what is your view? If any, does literature has a social role to play? I will tell you this, because here I think that there is a little bit of confusion. When I returned to El Salvador, I didn't return to do literature. I returned to, to found a newspaper and a magazine, and I was director of the newspaper, and I returned to do journalism. Journalism as a way of uh, creating a new political culture and opening spaces for the debate and to after a huge polarization and radicalization because of the civil war. And, and literature for me had or was supposed to grow of in this opening of spaces, but for me was not the key element to transform literature, right? uh, to transform reality. I never thought that literature transformed reality, and so it's, uh, that's a, a something that is very close, but it's not the same. Mm. Um, now I'm a, I'm a little bit more pessimistic, of course, not about literature, about society itself, but um, you see El Salvador in this moment is so terrible, right? I mean, everybody wants to leave. Nobody wants to be there, mm -hmm. right? So in a country where you don't want to be because you could be killed or you, mm, you can die because I was just thinking b because at the beginning we were talking about these television series that have uh, are playing an important role in um, in our lives. Also, um, maybe that was a moment of that illusion. That was a moment of illusion, and that was a moment of illusion. Why? Because uh, the civil war was over after 12 years of being fighting every day, and having two armies fighting inside. There was a statement, military statement, there was a negotiation, the United mm -hmm. Nations went, the US and the USSR by the time decided, okay, let's finish this war. And the war was ended and um, the left wanted communism, the right <coughs> wanted fascism, and in the end we got democracy, thanks God, because they couldn't get what they wanted. And so that was the new space. And that new space is called democratic transition, and a democratic transition creates illusion, creates hope mm -hmm. of a new, a new society. And of course, there was a new society in El Salvador, politically. Politically, El Salvador is a very institutional country. You know, there are all the rules of democracy, elections, Paris, different powers, uh, whatever you want to apply in sense independence of judicial power, whatever, whatever you want to apply, mm -hmm. that was a successful, successfully political transition. The point is that nothing changed in the social and the economic. Mm -hmm. And then you can see that life is quite complicated because you can have a very successful political transition to have a political class that has this good way of life and do politics as they want to do, but uh, people it doesn't have any opportunity to get job, to get health, to get education. And you have the security problem of crime by gangs everywhere. Mm. So it's complicated. Yeah. So <laughs> literature can't, uh, can change can't that. I can't go into I that. It's too deep. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, maybe it's time to give the, the floor to the audience. Um, you can um, ask your questions in English, Spanish, Dutch, French. I will try to translate them. Um, there's a microphone. So whoever wants to. Hi. Hi. Good, good evening, good Mr. Evening. Castellanos. My question is about migration a psychological aspect of migration. Uh, a few weeks ago, President Trump demanded that Mexico took serious actions regarding all the migration flows. And if not, he would impose, I think, 5% tariffs. Yeah. And so President Lopez Obrador decided <coughs> to send the army to the border with Guatemala. and. A poll 
came out recently showing that many Mexicans support this initiative. So my question is the following. Mexicans in the US or Mexicans in general complain that uh, the, their situation in the US is horrible, that the American government treats them very poorly. And now when the situation is turned around, they think, in fact, we don't want migrants here. So why does this happen? Wow. <laughs> That's quite deep. I mean, um, why people behave like that? Why Brazilians vote uh, this guy? Why American votes Trump? It's uh, quite difficult to understand why people behave as people behave. Uh, you can go into a lot of different explanations about politics or about economics or about social, but the fact is that sometimes you see that nationalism and or very primitive uh, emotions are very easily to be moved by some kind of leaderships, right? So I, I, I don't know exactly why, what I can tell, what I can tell is that Mexico has never been easy for Central American migrants. The killing of Central American migrants, the disappearance of tens of thousands of Central American migrants in Mexico is uh, a very well known news, right? So um, there are like collective fossas, I don't know how you say fossas, how do you say that? Graves. 500, 400 Central American migrants killed by Los Zetas or by Cartel del Golfo. So I think that it's very difficult. I don't have an answer for that. What I say is that it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible because what is happening now is like a kind of officialization or institutionalization of, of a policy against migrants. Before the killing attitude towards migrants was not official, it was the gangs or the cartels or whatever. Right? Now it's just close, it's officially and supported by people. But the worst part is what is going to happen in Central America if people cannot cross the river. What is going to happen there? And then, I don't know. But if you have seen the news, uh, I mean, there are people that have decided to walk from San Salvador or from Tegucigalpa to the U.S. border with two ch children. And so and how do you get that decision to leave? What happened to you in order that inside yourself you take that risk with your little kids? Could you imagine with two years old kid here and four years old kid here walking 7,000 miles or I don't know how many miles? And so what is going to happen to these people now that they cannot cross? They have to go back. What is going to happen to the societies? For me, that's the big question. I don't have an answer. Um, I was just thinking that it's very typical that as Latin, Latin American writers, you get these questions on politics and uh, yeah. social um, topics. Maybe a question about literature. Well, I'm sure that migration is really a very important topic. Nevertheless, I would like to go back to your literature. Um, the two characters in your novel are men. And as far as I remember in your other novels, the acting person, the character, not the, the one that killed, are also men. Is it your intention to dig into 
male behavior, male thinking, dominant male thinking, and people, uh, men, men adapting to it? Or do you also see the exchange between men and women? Well, and could you get into the brains of a woman? How <laughs> she behaves, mm -hmm. maybe? There is a book Because there. She, did, she may, did she devil in the mirror? That is the whole book written by a woman, and told by a woman. Uh, that's a novel that uh, in Spanish is La Diabla en el Espejo. There is another book there that is called Tyrant Memory, that half of the book is the diary of a woman in first person, of course, a diary. The other one is in first person. So in I have some books in which I go deeply into women's way of thinking, of course, not of European women's way of thinking, of Central American way of thinking women. In, in Tyrant memory takes place in 1944, and it's a woman that is a very conservative woman, a very good heart woman. Mm. And it's how she changes in the mentality of a Catholic woman. And she's uh, a grandmother. But her husband is in jail, and the dictatorship is collapsing. And the dictator behaves very bad with his husband, and so he has, she has started to organize other women for this fighting against the dictatorship of Maximiliano Rodney Martinez. That's the whole diary, entire memory. And for me, that was a challenge because it's the kind of character that is very far away from you. Not in the sense that I am a man and she is a woman. No, it's in the sense of values, right? How a conservative mentality could become progressive in a way, right? Just because the current of history um, is so strong. The other novel that is the whole novel is It's just one paragraph each chapter. And this is a lady of the, her name is Laura Rivera. There is a French edition. I don't know if they have it here. It's called uh, La Mort de Olga Maria. In that book, she, she's telling how her best friend was killed by a guy in front of her children in the living room of your house, just apparently for a rob of, uh, for uh, some kind of crime, but was just some kind of shooting, right? He went just to shoot her. And is all how he, she is affected by this and how she start to recreate the whole way of thinking of her social milieu in El Salvador in by the end of the Civil War. So every time that I go with men, woman mentality in a character, I try to grasp a very precise thing that I can handle, you know. In this novel, I didn't go into that because I didn't have something that I could handle, you know what I mean? I, someone, I, and a migrant, because these two are migrants. I didn't have a migrant that I could handle, that I could see. But um, for me, that's the way of doing things. I mean, if a character asks me, I go, right? I go. I, if you read, there is another book that is called La Sirvienta y el Luchador, that the main character, there are two main characters. La Sirvienta is uh, an old maid, And the luchador is a torturer. And it's the relationship between the two of them. And it's the relationship of the two of them, not because they have a relationship in the sense of, of, of a partner relationship, but how she knew all his killings and how she's trying to convince him to give her information of 
some people that she loves that has been kidnapped by the torturer. Torture belongs to the police, of course. And, and what happened between them with this approach, you know. So this case, this, my last two books are very male books in the sense that women are not main characters. But um, that's how it happens. Sometimes comes, sometimes doesn't come. Other questions? Mr. Castellanos Moya, uh, you said that uh, you say to your students that they uh, should find their own voice going deeply inside them. I think you have a very specific and original own voice, but it seems to me that a writer also constructs his own voice by reading. And my question would be, what books or writers have uh, helped you much uh, or more to find your own voice? Wow. <laughs> you know what? I'm an old man, so I've been reading my whole life, in a sense. So I cannot, I cannot say which writers have helped me to create my own voice. Because I think that writers sometimes they are not aware. Sometimes you are aware. But I can tell you what are my favorite periods of literature in history that maybe can give you some idea of what I read or what I go back to read because. Uh, and I would say that besides all the common places, for me, this, this literature that was written at the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in German, all these writers, Hermann Broth, Joseph Roth, Karl Kraus, those writers that were uh, writing in German, not all of them were German, of course, were coming from all around, were very important for me. I don't know why, don't ask me. But I can go back to them, even Stefan Zweig, you know, I can go back to them. I can tell you that all this writing of letters, diaries, of memoirs of the 18th century by French women for me was, has, it's all, it's still, you know, very important. That I can go with Madame Savignon, Madame uh, Dudefan, that I can go with you know, on the length clause, but, but I like this way of seeing life from the court. These this people were, have these saloons where all the writers came and they didn't, most of them, they didn't write novels, but they wrote diaries and they wrote memoirs and they, and they have a very peculiar way of seeing life, right? That's very peculiar French history. When I am blocked, I go to Sophocles, <laughs> right? Because it's my way of getting, getting some kind of, I don't know, this is, the, for me, tragedy is the key point, you know? Then Latin Americans, because maybe you want to hear more about our <laughs> contemporary times. I think that the most important writer for me from the 20th century in Latin America was Juan Carlos Sonetti from Uruguay. That doesn't mean that he influenced me in the sense that you can find his writing in my writing. Maybe there is nothing of him. Or that he can, you can find something of his personality in my personality. There is nothing of but for me, it's the most important, you know, it's very, this kind of empathies that has not to do with something in common, but much more indifferences. And of course, Rulfo and a great writer from Peru, Julio Ramon Ribeiro are for me, of course, writers that I, I, I go back to them, mainly in his personal writings in the case of Ribeiro. Um, then in Central America, Roque Dalton, because Rocky Dalton is not just about killing. Rocky Dalton was a guy, his poetry is amazing. I mean, it's like, 
I think that he was killed because he couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and he says in one of his verse, I mean, the problem of my life is that I can never stop laughing, right? So, but he laughed at people. He laughed at power. And power don't like laughing, you know? That doesn't like. Mm. Power don't like that. So power is, and so uh, for me it's very powerful that influence that you should laugh at power. And knowing that power will take revenge, but anyway. Okay, maybe two more uh, questions. We have five minutes left, maybe a little bit longer, but go ahead. Mauricio. Señor Castellanos, mm, tengo una pregunta y es, mm, usted me hace pensar en el libro que, que está presentando, en esa obra de Michel Foucault que se llama Vigilar y castigar, el nacimiento de la prisión. Y me pongo a pensar en eso cuando menciona lo de las cámaras, que están por todas partes vigilando a los personajes y los están increpando, ¿cierto? Entonces me pregunto, ¿usted cómo, eh, viviendo en los Estados Unidos, o que, que ha tenido la experiencia, cómo percibe esa, ese vigilar y castigar desde ese nacimiento de la prisión, que digamos que es la época contemporánea en los Estados Unidos específicamente y en todo el mundo donde todos estamos expuestos, vigilados, me hace pensar un poco también a la obra de 1984, la novela de, de yeah. Orson Welles. ¿Cómo lo ve usted? You would translate okay. Yeah, well, uh, briefly translate, although I don't know uh, the, the title of Foucault's book in, in English. Uh, but the question was about um, uh, Michel Foucault, who has written a book also about uh, surveillance. And um, so the question was, how uh, Mr. Castellanos Moya um, experiences the life in in um, in US today and this um, obsession with uh, surveillance, which all also um, uh, made uh, Mauricio think about uh, um, 1984. That was the, the question. I, I don't think that the Surveillance is an obsession of the U.S. I think that surveillance is everywhere now, here, there, everywhere. Mm, so it's part of our times. I guess that for young generations will be the normal, right? Mm -hmm. They won't think about that. <laughs> that will be part of their lives, or is part of their lives. Um, we, that we are a generation that are part of the past, but at the same time have some sense of the new that is coming, have a crisis about that, and think about that. But I see my kids, and they, they are happy of putting everything everywhere, you know. <laughs> everywhere. And that's uh, as everybody is, right? <laughs> so, um, For me, and for my generation, in a way, I guess it's a little bit more uncomfortable, but because um, what bothers me more is the lack of, of silence, right? The, like the lack of uh, interior space that uh, it seems that today I was waiting for the plane in front of the gate in Stockholm, and there was this lady. And she was talking by phone, but then, I mean, I was having my lunch, three, four minutes, five minutes, change, stop one phone call, next phone call. And she was talking in a way that everybody could hear. Nobody complained, and I, and I started to feel a little bit harassed, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I got my book and started to read the book very aloud. <laughs> 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 but very aloud <laughs> in Spanish, right? Because I was reading a translation of Robert Balser in Spanish. And so 
but then it made me think, right? It's like, it's normal, right? But for, but I mean, top five minutes, but then I finished my whole lunch. And so there is no possibility of silence. It's an airport, of course. But if you see, f for me it's a problem, but for new generations it's not. I mean, for me, there is no way of being disconnected of your senses, right? No way. And I was raised, or maybe I learned along my life that you have to be a little bit distressful of your senses and you need a space in your mind and in your being to think about yourself and about human being and about life and about what is happening. And that, I, I'm concerned a little bit what is going, how is going to be the human being when, when I won't be here, right? It's not that long. It's and how is going to be this human being that doesn't have a space inside himself or herself to to think, because he's connected all the time to the senses, right? Who knows? I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for a last question? If there is any. Um, I will be honest. Uh, tonight is my uh, the first uh, uh, the way I get to know you and your your work. And um, in the beginning, I heard that you were uh, first uh, you were a journalist, and then you became uh, a novelist. And I was wondering what made you change your. Uh, your profession? Well, that's not clear either mm -hmm. because <laughs> I started as a, I became journalist to, to survive, but I, I became as a poet. I mean, I started as a poet when I was in my 90s, 80s, 18s, I was, I was writing poetry, trying to go to the university to study literature. And that's how I started. I didn't st then I got a job as a journalist. Right, but for me, journalism was a was a job, as you could work as a policeman, as a judge, or as a doctor. You know, of course, you need a passion to do whatever, right? So I had a passion for journalism, but I, for me, journalism was political power mainly. But I knew that literature was my issue, was my internal issue, my things that I don't deal. I don't do business in the sense of uh, that I can do it with journalism. You know, journalism, you are part of a kind of machinery. And if your editor says that doesn't go because the president says that we are going to lose 40% of our advertisement because that article of yours, you think about it, right? And the editor doesn't think, just gets rid of the article. But literature is yours, right? Literature is, the si is something that where you are free, where you can look for whatever is good or bad inside yourself that you want to tell, and what you see on other people too, and what you s imagine in other people too. And it's not something that uh, you deal in the same way. So I didn't do that traditional uh, step of a kind of successful journalist that become a novelist. No, I, I was a poet. I was a poor young poet that the only way of getting a job was doing journalism, right? And so and that's how I started. But they never stopped the other thing. But I never mixed them. No, because there is a case, there are these successful cases of people that mix them, like Hemingway or Garcia Marquez, you know, that they are both. For me, I'm very schizophrenic in that sense. One is one thing, one is the other thing, right? Here I, I negotiate, here I don't negotiate. You know, it's like the way my mind works. Mm -hmm. So literature is, is yours, I think that's a nice quote to, to end with. Uh, and to remember 
Um, thanks, Mr. Thanks Castellanos you, Moya. Thank Jasper. you for your uh, attention and your uh, interesting yes. questions. Um, thanks, Pasaporta. And uh, let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>